Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before we begin, um, let me observe that there are heavy hearts around the White House complex today as we mourn the loss of our former colleague and friend, Brandon Lipa. Brandon passed away last night, surrounded by friends and family after a long and spirited fight against cancer. Brandon worked on the President's campaign in 2008 uh, and continued, continued here at the White House, uh, first in the advanced shop before moving over to our communications operation. So many of you um, also got to know him well. We're saddened by Brandon, Brandon's death, but I know I'm not the only one who continue, continues to be inspired uh, by his life and the way that he lived it. I've been thinking about Brandon's family, and particularly his parents, as they mourn the loss of their son. But as a relatively new father myself, I've also been thinking about the kind of man that I want my son to grow up to be. Uh, and Brandon's courage in confronting tough challenges, his selflessness and humility in interacting both with those he loved and those he barely knew, and his passion for what he believed in makes him a genuine role model. So to his wife, Teresa, who bravely and loyally walked every step of a difficult path with Brandon over the last few years, please know that there are a lot of people in our nation's capital and around the country who are sending a lot of love to you today. And Brandon, buddy, we're really going to miss you, uh, but we're sure going to do our best to live up to the high standard that you set. So with that, uh, let's get down to business. Uh, and I promised last week in the briefing uh, a brief um, presentation about uh, the TPP. Um, so uh, in our conversations, uh, I'm sorry? <laughs> Your lucky day. Um, fortunately, I have some visuals that might make this uh, more entertaining than my usual uh, beginning. So be patient with me. There are, um, we know that when the rules of trade are fair, uh, that Americans can outcompete anyone in the world. Uh, and that's the idea that's at the heart of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, and a new report that was recently released by the USTR details how the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement would slash 18,000 taxes uh, that various countries put on American uh, goods. Um, so for example, let me start with Ohio. Ohio is a good example. Uh, tires that are made in America, in Ohio, uh, face foreign tariffs, uh, or I'm sorry, they face tariffs or foreign taxes as high as 40%. Uh, and you'll recall that in the past, um, concerns have been raised about the impact that foreign countries like China have had on our factories and our workers when they dump tires into markets here in the United States. Uh, in keeping with the President's commitment to strong trade enforcement, the United States has worked aggressively through the WTO to hold China accountable for violating trade rules. Um, there are a number of occasions in which that's taken place. The, TT, the TPP actually goes one step further by making sure that manufacturers aren't at a disadvantage, disadvantage when they sell their tires abroad uh, to any of our 11 TPP countries. So Ohio is a good example. Uh, foreign taxes on uh, tires made in America and shipped from Ohio uh, are, high, are as high as 40 percent. Uh, and under the TPP, uh, those would be eliminated. Uh, let me give you the examples of some other uh, states that may resonate. Uh, let's take Texas, for example. Leather boots. Uh, that are shipped from Texas to TPP countries face foreign taxes as high as 30 percent. Uh, and obviously those would be taxes that would be eliminated under the TPP. Uh, just to choose another example, how about Kentucky? Kentucky is a, a state known for its bourbon. Uh, some TPP countries uh, place foreign taxes on uh, bourbon as high as 45 percent. Uh, those tariffs would be eliminated through the TPP. Uh, let's consider Michigan. Michigan obviously is well known for exporting cars around the world. These are American cars made by American workers. Uh, in some TPP countries, uh, these automobiles face a foreign tax of up to 70 percent, a tax that would be eliminated through the TPP. Uh, just to choose another state, how about Iowa? Uh, Iowa is a state that uh, produces a significant quantity of pork that is shipped around the world and enjoyed by millions of people around the globe. Uh, some uh, foreign countries put an exorbitantly high tax on American pork, uh, up to 388 percent before it can be imported into another country. Now, obviously, those uh, tariffs would be eliminated under the TPP. Uh, also consider Alabama, uh, a state that, has, uh, uh, that is known for producing uh, iron and steel. And good football. Uh, and good football. Uh, I don't know if the tax on football would be affected by the TPP, but the tax on iron and steel, it's as high as 20 percent. And some TPP countries would be eliminated. 
Uh, just two more examples. Uh, everybody knows about cheese in Wisconsin. Uh, other countries in the TPP currently have a foreign tax on Wisconsin cheese at up to 40%, uh, a tax that would be eliminated uh, under the TPP. Uh, and last and certainly not least, a state that's close to my heart, the great state of Missouri, the Show Me State, uh, produces barbecue sauce that is world renowned. Uh, this is barbecue sauce that currently faces, in some countries, uh, a foreign tax as high as 30%. Uh, and uh, in Missouri, we believe that everybody should have the benefits of enjoying delicious barbecue sauce. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we, uh, by moving forward with the TPP, we can eliminate that uh, foreign tax on barbecue sauce as well. What could be more American than that? Um, so with that uh, preview uh, and the possibility that we may refer to these slides again over the course of the briefing, uh, we can uh, go to your questions. What's next? Sock puppets? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it takes, Mark. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about Syria. Yes. Um, how fearful is the White House that the conflict there is turning into some sort of a proxy war between the U.S. and Russia, given that both sides are providing different rebel groups with weapons, mm -hmm. and a lot of these groups are you know, on different sides of the conflict? Uh, Darlene, I think the President was fairly definitive in the news conference that he did uh, 10 or 12 days ago in which he made clear that the conflict in Syria would not turn into a proxy war between the United States and Russia. Uh, that is a firm commitment that the President has made, and uh, that's something that we will uh, abide by. Uh, the reason for that, uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. The first is that we would welcome Russia's constructive contribution to the broader international coalition that's been formed to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Russia has declined to make that con constructive contribution thus far, uh, but that continues to be something that we're open to. Secondly, the uh, efforts of our international coalition that was built and led by the United States is one that is focused on ISIL. Uh, our, we, this is a multi-pronged strategy focused on degrading and ultimately destroying ISIL. Uh, Russia claims to share that goal. Uh, thus far, we believe that they've pursued a strategy that it actually undermines the effective pursuit of that goal. Uh, but we would welcome uh, a change in their strategy to more effectively accomplish the goal that they uh, have claimed to set out for themselves. The final thing is that the President's top priority when it comes to confronting a very difficult situation in Syria is the safety and security of the American people. And that is why there are any number of military strikes that the President has ordered against extremists operating inside of Syria. Uh, in some cases, these are ISIL extremists. Uh, in, sub, in some cases, these are extremists not affiliated with ISIL, but yet uh, leading extremist organizations trying to capitalize on the chaos in Syria to plan and execute terror attacks against uh, the United States and our interests around the world. Uh, and that is, that is the fo focus of our efforts there. Uh, and there certainly is uh, ample rhetoric that we see from Republican critics uh, essentially goading the President to try to um, engage in a proxy war with Russia. Uh, they say that uh, ostensibly because they think maybe that it makes them look tough. Uh, but I think they would have a very difficult time articulating why that would be in the clear national security interests of the United States of America. Being committed to something is one thing. How do you, and I understand you say that he's committed to keeping it from becoming a proxy war, but how do you actually you know, prevent it from turning into that? Well, I think by ensuring that our efforts are focused on ISIL. Uh, and we, there is a uh, multifaceted strategy that we have put forward to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. And it is countering ISIL uh, that is the focal point of our efforts inside of Syria right now. We're hopeful that that will also lead to the kind of political transition uh, that we would uh, that would reduce the level of chaos uh, inside of Syria. Uh, countering Russia's uh, involvement in Syria uh, doesn't rate uh, nearly as high on the scale. Uh, yesterday, at the State Department uh, spokesman John Kirby said that the U.S. was still monitoring reports of the conviction of the Washington Post reporter Jason Rosian, mm -hmm. um, and that the U.S. hadn't received any official confirmation that he had been convicted. Do you have any sort of an update on that today? 
Um, well, there is a, there's a, there's not much clarity uh, about the current uh, trial of uh, Jason Rezaian, a United States citizen currently being held in Iran. Uh, there have been sporadic reports and uh, apparently a confirmation or two from um, a, a spokesman affiliated with the justice system there, uh, indicating that um, Mr. Rezaian has been convicted. Uh, but the, but we've not heard that through official channels, uh, and there obviously has no been no formal announcement of such a conviction. Uh, the, it's not particularly surprising that the situation uh, is unclear because the entire proceedings against him have been opaque, and that has been a principal concern that we've articulated with his unjust detention. Uh, throughout this process, uh, there has been an unwillingness on the part of the Iranians uh, to be candid about what their intentions are. Uh, and in fact, um, what is clear is that their intention is to continue to detain him unjustly. Uh, and that is something that we are quite concerned about in the same way that we're quite concerned about the unjust detention uh, of Amir Hekmati and Saeed Abedini uh, inside of Iran. We also have concerns about um, the whereabouts of the U.S. citizen Robert Levinson, um, who was last known to be inside of Iran, but we've not gotten cooperation from the Iranians uh, in trying to, that we would like to get uh, to determine uh, Mr. Levinson's whereabouts. So we've got a number of concerns, uh, and the lack of clarity uh, around this particular situation is not surprising. In fact, it's consistent uh, with the kind of sham process that they've been running over there for several years now. Finally, what is your sense on whether the president will watch some or all of tonight's debate, or will he wait for the highlights in the morning? <laughs> um, I wouldn't be surprised if the president catches uh, part of the debate tonight. Uh, I don't think that he will uh, watch it wire to wire. Uh, there is a, uh, some pretty good playoff baseball on tonight. So uh, I would anticipate that he may be uh, doing a little channel surfing. Uh, but the president is certainly interested uh, in the debate. and. Um, what he doesn't catch uh, live and in person, I'm confident that he will uh, see in the uh, coverage of the debate. And, um, you know, as mentioned in the context of the two Republican debates that have been held so far, uh, this kind of robust discussion uh, in public in front of the American people, where the candidates lay out their vision and priorities for the country, uh, is good for our democracy. Uh, it's a good opportunity for the American people and voters to carefully consider uh, the platform on which each candidate is running. Uh, and the President welcomes a robust, healthy, vigorous debate uh, about the many uh, opportunities and challenges that are facing the country right now. Okay. Julia. Thanks, Josh. Um, can you – I wanted to get your response to Iranian uh, ballistic missile testing over uh -huh. the weekend. Um, which appears to be in violation of the UN ban against their using ballistic missiles. The defense minister said that Iran would not ask permission to strengthen its defense and missile capabilities. Um, what's the U.S. response, and, and how does that bode for Iran's capability to hold up its end of the agreement and the Iran nuclear agreement? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, the missile tests that we did see over the weekend um, are we've got strong indications that those missile tests uh, did violate uh, UN Security Council resolutions that pertain to Iran's ballistic missile activities. Uh, unfortunately, that's not new. Uh, we have seen Iran on uh, almost serially uh, violate the international community's um, concerns uh, about their ballistic missile program. and. The UN Security Council resolution actually gives the international community uh, some tools to uh, interdict some equipment uh, and material that could be used to advance their ballistic missile program, uh, and gives us uh, the ability to work in concert with our partners around the world um, uh, to engage a, a strategy to try to disrupt uh, continued progress of their ballistic missile program. But this is altogether separate from the uh, nuclear agreement that Iran reached with the rest of the world. Uh, in contrast to the repeated violations uh, of 
the UN Security Council resolution that pertains to their ballistic missile activities. We've seen that Iran, over the last couple of years, has demonstrated um, a track record of abiding by the commitments that they made in the context of the nuclear talks. Uh, and there was a lot of skepticism. Remember, even two or three years ago, in the early stages of the nuclear talks, many critics of the administration said that engaging in these kinds of talks uh, would be counterproductive because there was no way that Iran would abide by the commitments that they made. And in fact, Iran had previously used the cover of talks to make progress on their nuclear program. Uh, but over the last two or three years, we have seen Iran uh, live up to some very uh, tough standards when it comes to limiting uh, their nuclear program. And um, that said, we have been saying all along that the nuclear agreement that Iran reached with the rest of the world will not be predicated on trust, but it will be predicated on the most robust, intrusive set of inspections that have ever been imposed on a country's nuclear program. Uh, so uh, we will be able to verify uh, Iran's compliance with the nuclear agreement. And if they don't, there is a very specified set of responses that can be um, implemented to respond to the vi those violations. Uh, so uh, that's the approach that we have uh, taken thus far. Um, it uh, does um, hold, the light, hold the potential uh, of us uh, succeeding in uh, expanding the breakout period for Iran, preventing them from obtaining a nuclear weapon. And in fact, uh, if Iran does verifiably uphold the terms of this agreement, it would do more to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon than even a military strike would. Uh, and that is why the President has pursued uh, this course, uh, and it's one that we will um, uh, seek to implement consistent with the agreement that was reached uh, a couple of months ago. Okay. Iraq has started bombing Islamic State targets with help from the Intelligence Center that's run by uh, Russia, Iran, and Syria partners. Uh, does the White House welcome uh, the attacks because they're against the Islamic State, or is there some skepticism about the way uh, Iraq is coordinating these attacks with Iraq, Iran, and Syria? Well, let me start by ob uh, observing the obvious, which is that uh, Iraq is a sovereign nation in a complex region of the world. And with the possible exception of Syria, uh, no nation has faced uh, a greater threat from ISIL than Iraq that the security situation in Iraq um, in the summer of 2014 was virtually turned upside down by the rapid ISIL advance across western and even uh, significant parts of northern Iraq. Uh, and it has required uh, Iraq to undertake a political transition uh, and uh, have a government that is much more effective in unifying the, the nation of Iraq across sectarian lines uh, that's had a corresponding positive impact on the ability of Iraq security forces to take the fight to ISIL. Uh, and we know that ISIL is a determined enemy uh, and that it will ultimately be a long effort to degrade and ultimately destroy them. Uh, in fact, that is why we built a multi-national uh, coalition of some 65 different nations to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. And that coalition has worked effectively with the Iraqis uh, to make progress uh, against ISIL inside of Iraq. Um, and we believe that those coordinated uh, efforts through our counter-ISIL coalition will be more effective than the unilateral efforts uh, of nations like Russia and Syria. Okay. All right. Tola. Uh, thanks, Josh. The Taliban has said that they're pulling out, of, or they have pulled out of Kunduz mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. I wanted to get your reaction to that and also um, see if that might have an, an impact on the broader discussion of when to withdraw troops from, uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, Tolu, I, we have seen those reports, uh, and obviously that is a, uh, a welcome sign. Uh, I think it is an indication that the uh, Afghan national security forces do have a significant capability that's been built up over the last few years, uh, thanks in no small part to the dedication of uh, the NATO uh, force that's operating in Afghanistan to train, equip, uh, and advise the Afghan National Security Forces. Um, 
so the fact that they were um, overrun in Kunduz in the first place was a setback, uh, but their ability to regroup and retake the city uh, is an indication of the resilience uh, and capability of the Afghan security forces. Um, as I mentioned before, the uh, President does have a policy decision to make as it relates to our uh, future military presence inside of Afghanistan. Uh, and certainly conditions on the ground will influence that process, uh, but they will not dictate the outcome. Uh, that there are a range of considerations that the President uh, will factor in in making that decision. And I don't have an update for you at this point on uh, what the decision will be or when it will be announced. I wanted to ask about the South China Sea. There are reports that um, the U.S. is planning to send a warship um, to some of the contested waters, uh, potentially within 12 nautical miles of, uh, of some of the uh, islands that have been built there. And I'm wondering, um, specifically because China has said that they would not condone um, their territorial waters uh, being breached, what, uh, what your message would be to, uh, to, Ch to the Chinese on this. Yeah. Well, I think the, the President delivered a pretty clear and resounding message in the Rose Garden when he was standing next to President Xi uh, at the end of last month, uh, in which he declared, not for the first time, that the United States will continue to sail, fly, and operate anywhere in the world that international law allows. Um, so uh, the fact is that the Department of Defense uh, regularly conducts freedom of navigation operations uh, around the world. Um, my colleagues at the NSC pulled some uh, statistics for me that I thought were interesting. In 2014, the Department of Defense challenged the excessive maritime claims of 18 different nations. Uh, these are nations as diverse as Iran, uh, around the Strait of Hormuz, uh, and other nations with whom we have much warmer relations, uh, nations like uh, Nicaragua, uh, India, and Brazil. So there are a variety of reasons that the Department of Defense would carry out uh, operations like this, so it's certainly not a situation where uh, the Chinese uh, would be singled out. Uh, but at this point, I don't have any uh, sort of policy announcements uh, to share with you, uh, other than um, uh, you know what the president said in the Rose Garden when he was standing next to President Xi. Um, I wanted to ask about the Iran deal. It was, I guess, approved by the Iranian parliament first. Do you have any reaction to, to it being approved over there? Well, that was the, actually the one thing I was, um, uh, that I failed to mention in response to Julia's question. Uh, I'm certainly no expert in Iranian politics, but I suspect that it is no coincidence that shortly after the, uh, the modulus signed off on the uh, Iran deal, that there was a decision made by some inside of Iran to conduct a ballistic missile test that uh, garnered the strong opposition and objection uh, of the international community. Uh, so that's, uh, let me just make that observation first. Um, I don't have a specific reaction to the, uh, to the approval, however, um, you know, other than to point to it as an indication uh, that you know, we continue to be uh, on a path toward the successful implementation uh, of this uh, international agreement. And there, just to follow up on that, there was a report in, in Fox News a couple days ago about um, the foreign subsidiary loophole that's part of this deal, um, that when sanctions would be um, relaxed, that U.S. companies that have foreign subsidiaries would also have their sanctions relaxed. And, um, there was a question as to whether or not that violates a previous law that was signed in 2012 um, that says that we could that, this, that the U.S. cannot relax those sanctions unless you know, certain conditions are met. Um, so I'm wondering if the legality of, uh, of this of this deal continues to sort of be in question, and whether that specific clause is something that the White House has looked at. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not aware of the specific uh, report that you're citing, Tolu. Uh, I will say there is no question at all about the legality of the international agreement to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, and just to be clear, Iran will not get sanctions relief uh, under this deal until they have taken significant and verifiable steps to significantly curtail their nuclear program. And this is everything from, just as a reminder, because I've said this many times, disconnecting thousands of centrifuges uh, to uh, reducing their uh, stockpile by 98%. Uh, or uh, essentially gutting the core of the heavy water reactor uh, at Iraq. So these are significant steps that Iran still must take before any sanctions relief uh, will be uh, offered. And there's no denying the uh, legal justification of moving forward with this agreement. Are you all planning um, for any um, legal challenges? I know previous things that the President has endorsed um, have been 
held up in the court. So I'm wondering if this is something that you're preparing for. Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, legal challenges that have been filed against uh, uh, against uh, uh, the effort to implement this uh, this deal. Uh, but um, you know, we'll, all, we'll obviously be. Uh, if any, if any challenges are filed, we certainly would feel confident our, about our ability to prevail in a court of law. Okay. Olivia. Josh, you said that there are strong indications that this missile test violated the UN Security Council resolutions. Why can't you be more affirmative and say that it did or did not? I asked this question myself this morning, uh, and I don't know if this is an overly uh, lawyered construction. I think the sense is that there's more information about the specifics of the missile launch that need to be collected before a definitive statement can be made uh, about whether or not it is in violation uh, of uh, this existing uh, UN uh, Security Council resolution. Uh, but based on what has been reported publicly, uh, there are strong indications that it is a violation of those Security Council resolutions that are on the books. Okay. And then you, you referred to a scale of U.S. interests in Syria, starting with preventing attacks on U.S. targets and then including countering uh, ISIL, countering Russia. Could you put uh, more U.S. interests in this constellation? Explain to me what, what's the, obviously you've, you've said what the core one is. What are the other ones? Where does, for example, regional stability fit into this? Where does abating the humanitarian crisis fit into this? What's the, what's the order here? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, obviously, it, it's probably hard for me to give you a real specific uh, uh, description because, because it's something I just made up as we were talking at the beginning here. Um, but I can certainly articulate to you what our priorities are. Uh, and the top priority is clearly the safety and security of the American people. And uh, we've talked at length about the strikes that have been taken inside of Syria to take uh, extremists off the battlefield. Some of those are ISIL-affiliated uh, operatives. In some cases, they are uh, extremists not affiliated with ISIL, but dangerous nonetheless. Uh, so that is clearly the top priority. Uh, degrading and ultimately destroying ISIL is a significant priority, uh, both because of the uh, national security threat that they, pay, that they pose to the United States, uh, but also because of the degree to which they have caused uh, instability throughout an already volatile region of the world. Um, there also is a focus on, uh, or a priority placed upon, uh, completing a long overdue political transition inside of Syria. Uh, we have pointed to the political problems inside of Syria and the failed political leadership of President Assad uh, as the root cause of so many of these problems. Uh, and even the Russians have acknowledged uh, that a political transition uh, will be necessary to uh, get to the, uh, uh, to the root cause of so many of these problems. Uh, obviously, the scale of the humanitarian crisis that has been caused by the violence inside of Syria is uh, significant and even historic. Uh, to see millions of people fleeing Syria uh, and millions of other people displaced inside of Syria fleeing violence uh, is um, a significant challenge. Uh, this is a po political conflict that has turned violent that has upended the lives of millions of uh, innocent Syrians. And the United States continues to be the, the largest donor of humanitarian assistance uh, to this crisis. Uh, and you know, as recently as just a couple of weeks ago, we announced uh, that our, the sum total of our assistance now was up to about $4.5 billion. Uh, that is a significant commitment of U.S. resources uh, to try to meet the basic humanitarian needs of Syrian citizens who are just in a terrible, a desperate situation. Uh, so I would, I would characterize those as, uh, uh, as our top priorities. Uh, and Olivia, the, the reason that we're not particularly concerned uh, about trying to mobilize a strategy to counter Russia uh, inside of Syria is that Russia is operating from a position of weakness. Syria is home to the only Russian military outpost outside of the former Soviet Union. And four or five years ago, that uh, was an outpost that was um, generously protected by a uh, tyrant uh, in the form of uh, Bashar al-Assad. Uh, but because of Asha Assad's failed leadership, because of the chaos that has been um, sown uh, into that country, the security situation around that military base and 
uh, about the government that uh, led the country where that military base was located, uh, a lot of concerns were raised about Russia's investment in that country. Uh, and so Russia for years has been trying to address this problem in a variety of ways, offering political support to Assad, offering financial support to Assad, uh, offering some other material forms of support uh, to the Assad regime. And now Russia, seeing that each of those contributions was insufficient, uh, has had now had to mobilize a significant commitment of military assets to try to shore up Assad and protect their uh, military investment uh, inside of Syria. So uh, that's why countering Russia's activities in that uh, country uh, doesn't rate nearly as high on the scale as uh, those other priorities that I outlined. Okay. Cheryl. Thanks, Josh. Um, as you know, highway funding expires October 29th. Um, one of the things that Paul Ryan was supposed to be thinking about was ways to pay for a highway bill, a long-term highway bill. Now with the speaker's race open, are you concerned that there's going to have to be another short-term extension of highway funding? Well, uh, the President acknowledged in his news conference, I think maybe even in response to your question, that there certainly was the potential that the upheaval around the speaker's race could have an impact on the ability of Congress uh, to fulfill all of their basic obligations, uh, including uh, ensuring that the uh, transportation uh, trust fund doesn't run out. Uh, and that was even before Kevin McCarthy dropped out of the race. Uh, so uh, the, the turmoil there has only uh, multiplied uh, since the President acknowledged that that was the case. So uh, at this point, you know, we're going to continue to make a strong case. It's one I think that is quite well received on Capitol Hill, which is there's strong bipartisan support for investments in infrastructure projects that uh, we know are good for the local economies of communities all across the country. Uh, and traditionally, investments in transportation infrastructure have garnered strong bipartisan support on Capitol Hill. Uh, and we're hopeful that they will uh, again. Uh, these repeated short-term extensions uh, are certainly not an effective way for state governments across the country to plan uh, what in some cases are particularly complicated transportation infrastructure projects. If you're trying to plan uh, and execute a, uh, an infrastructure project that would take place over two or three years, getting funded in uh, two or three month in, uh, increments uh, is going to be problematic. Uh, and so that's why the President's put forward his own plan for a long-term extension uh, of, the, uh, of the transportation uh, funding stream. Uh, and what the President envisions is not just an extension uh, of that funding stream at current levels, but actually a significant increase uh, in the investment that's made in transportation infrastructure. The President also put forward a very specific way for paying for it, because he believes that we can do that in a fiscally responsible way. Uh, but we're going to need to see Congress act uh, and um, again, you know, I've made this observation before. We're not waiting on Congress to take some sort of ambitious step forward in pursuit of a visionary proposal for the country. We just want Congress to do the bare minimum. We're just asking for members of Congress to fulfill their basic responsibility to pass a budget, to protect the full faith and credit of the United States, uh, and make sure that we can have a 21st century infrastructure in the United States. Uh, these are not, again, uh, as much as I would like to tout the President's proposal, and I have, um, I don't think it trends toward the visionary. Uh, these are basic, fundamentally responsibilities of the United States Congress. Uh, and far too often over the last four years, under Republican leadership, uh, we have seen Congress stub their toe time and time again in trying to fulfill these basic functions. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons for that, um, but uh, you know, we're hopeful uh, that maybe um, that Republicans in Congress will figure out uh, that these basic responsibilities that are so clearly in the best interest of the American people uh, will start to take precedence uh, over the strongly held ideological views of some uh, vocal members of their conference. So do you believe then that Speaker Boehner in his last couple weeks left needs to put the highway bill and the debt ceiling increase on the floor, work with Democrats, and get that passed? Well, uh, Speaker Boehner himself has made a reference to uh, his willingness to clean out the barn before he leaves. Uh, and as I mentioned previously, uh, that whether it's uh, a willingness on the part uh, of those of us here at the White House to grab a mop or a hose or whatever is required, uh, 
uh, a shovel. Uh, we stand ready to help. Uh, and um, so we'll, we're hopeful that, um, that many of these uh, kinds of things uh, will be on the table for discussion prior to uh, Speaker Boehner's uh, departure. Okay, Byron. Thanks, Josh. Uh, in the interview that the President gave 60 Minutes, he was asked about Secretary Clinton's email server, and he said, and I quote, I can tell you this is not a situation in which America's national security was in danger. How does he know that? Because there's two inspector generals that disagree, and the FBI is investigating. Well, uh, the President was making a, a, an observation about what we know uh, so far, uh, which is that um, Secretary Clinton herself has uh, turned over a bunch of email uh, to the State Department. Uh, and the review of that email has garnered some differing assessments uh, about what's included in there. But she made clear that nothing that was stamped, uh, classified, was sent to her from that email account. Uh, and uh, we know that to be true based on what has been collected so far. Um, so I think what the President was uh, observing uh, is that Secretary Clinton has acknowledged that uh, this was a mistake. Uh, and, uh, but she's cooperating with uh, the inspectors general who are taking a look at this and uh, even with a, a partisan investigation on Capitol Hill, uh, the eighth one, uh, to take a look at this. Uh, that's obviously the right thing for her to do. But, you know, we've, we've heard you many times, uh, you know, uh, for a variety of different topics say, I cannot comment on an ongoing investigation. There is an ongoing counterintelligence investigation on this. Why did the President decide to comment, given, given that the FBI is looking at this? Mm -hmm. Well, he made that, uh, that observation based on what is publicly known now. Uh, and what we publicly know now is that uh, no information that was stamped classified was sent to uh, or um, sent from that, uh, that particular email server. His comments be read as an attempt to steer the direction of that FBI investigation? Uh, of course not. Uh, the President certainly respects the uh, independence and integrity of uh, independent investigations, including those that are conducted by the FBI. Okay. Ron. Will the President watch the debate tonight? Well, as I mentioned to, uh, to Darlene, I would uh, uh, anticipate that the, the President will uh, probably see some of the debate uh, on television tonight, but uh, there's also some playoff baseball on television tonight, so I imagine the President might be doing some channel surfing. Uh, but he certainly will be um, uh, aware of the highlights and aware of the coverage and interested in the kind of uh, robust debate that he believes is good for the country and good for our democracy. Sorry if you went over this. Um, it's okay. Uh, in the, I'm not sure I quite asked this, but um, in his discussions with Vice President Biden, has this issue of him not participating in the debate ever come up? Uh, I have uh, made it a point to not read out the, the private conversations between the President and the Vice President on a variety of topics, including uh, the Vice President's uh, possible presidential aspirations. Uh, so uh, I don't know whether it's come up, but even if I did, I don't think I'd be willing to talk about it from here. In terms of, I, I can respect that, and, and respectfully, is there is there a sense here that at some point in the very near future the Vice President will make a decision or needs to make a decision? Well, I uh, think that this has become a headline, uh, yeah. for better or worse. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I think the Vice President himself uh, has, in a couple of different public settings, acknowledged that uh, he'll have to make a decision relatively soon. And, uh, you know, it has been our position here since over the summer uh, that Vice President Biden will be given all of the time uh, and space that he needs to, uh, to reach this decision. And, um, you know, he's obviously doing what he needs to do in order to uh, consider that uh, possibility. Uh, but he'll make a decision and announce it uh, on a time frame of his choosing. These notions that the clock is ticking, are perhaps your reaction to that? Well, I think that is a, that is a, that's a matter of uh, simple physics when it comes to time and space here. Um, so uh, I would, I would uh, stipulate that that's true. Uh, but in terms of, uh, of um, you know, what, what sort of pressures he's facing in terms of his time frame for getting in the race, uh, those are uh, those are pressures that he'll evaluate independently, and uh, obviously will factor into his decision. I'm sure. Uh, in terms of the president's television watching, and forgive me if you've been asked. Uh, Donald Trump's going to host Saturday Night Live. Will he watch that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually had not heard that, um, but uh, it sounds interesting. I have it from very high sources. I'll bet you do. Uh, <laughs> I'll bet you do. I'll bet you do. Uh, I don't know if the president uh, will watch that or not. He's never so. done the show himself. Uh, he's participated, but he's never hosted. Uh, I don't believe that President Obama has hosted the show, but he's been on. Uh, 
uh, had a walk-on appearance uh, three or four times, I believe. Okay. Kevin. Thanks, Josh. Was Vladimir Putin wrong when he said uh, to Tash yesterday, we could have used the money that was set aside for the Syrian fighter program and done a much better job of fighting international terrorism than the U.S. did? Well, um, I didn't see those specific comments, but uh, I would say that right now the money that Russia is using uh, to try to shore up their investment inside of Syria uh, is, frankly, good money that they're uh, throwing after bad. Uh, the longstanding efforts that Russia has been engaged in over the last four or five years to try to prop up the Assad regime have not succeeded. Uh, and, in fact, this doubling down that we're, we've seen from the Russians on the Assad regime uh, is a losing bet uh, and is only uh, likely to draw Russia further into a sectarian conflict, uh, even a quagmire. Uh, and it certainly does uh, raise uh, significant questions about their purported strategy to go after extremists. Uh, the fact is the strategy that they're engaged in right now um, only makes it harder to build up the capacity of a moderate opposition that would be part of a political transition uh, and only puts uh, Russia at greater risk uh, of facing the anger and ire of otherwise moderate Syrian opposition figures uh, who are hoping for a political transition inside that country. Uh, and continued strikes at moderate opposition targets inside of Syria only emboldens ISIL. So we've seen some reports out of Syria, uh, including around Aleppo where Russia has taken strikes against moderate opposition fighters that have actually paved the way for ISIL to capitalize on the, uh, the weakness of the moderate opposition in that uh, region of Syria. Uh, and so by striking non-extremist targets and, focus and not focusing on ISIL, uh, Russia is allowing ISIL to fester and expand and make itself more of a target by violent extremists in Syria and potentially back at home. Speaking of, I want to sort of understand your mindset when you say the U.S. will not engage in a proxy war in Syria. The President made that very clearly uh, understood, but I'm trying to understand or square what's your definition of a proxy war if we're funding opposition fighters and they're fighting against Russian-supported forces. Isn't that sort of the definition of a proxy war? Well, I guess, Kevin, what the goal of U.S. involvement inside of Syria uh, is focused on our counter-ISIL strategy, uh, and that is to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Uh, and some of the support uh, that we're providing to elements of the Syrian uh, moderate opposition, support that's been ramped up uh, in just the last few days, uh, is geared toward um, trying to drive ISIL out of uh, different regions of Syria, principally in northeastern Syria. Uh, and you know, we did talk at the end of last week uh, about the renewed support uh, that the uh, United States will be offering to Syrian Arabs. Uh, and I, the Department of Defense did confirm over the weekend uh, that a, an Air Force C-17 aircraft dropped small arms ammunition to Syrian Arab groups fighting ISIL in northeastern Syria. Uh, and that successful airdrop provided ammunition to those Syrian Arab groups uh, whose leaders were vetted by the United States and have been fighting to move ISIL out of northeastern Syria. That's what our strategy is. Uh, and that is a strategy that's focused on ISIL, is a strategy that has the strong support of the international community, some 65 nations who are part of our coalition. And that start in, stands in stark contrast to the unilateral efforts of the Russians to indiscriminately strike uh, opposition groups with the goal of propping up the Assad regime. Uh, and uh, it is clear that our intentions uh, are quite different than theirs, uh, despite what uh, the Russian government says publicly. Russia would uh, regularly c claims to be focused on countering ISIL, but that certainly is not uh, what we see uh, when it comes to evaluating their efforts on the ground. Did you hear about the report that uh, U.S. aircraft and Russian aircraft were close enough within miles to make visual identification? Well, uh, I have heard those reports. Uh, for the details of that, I'd, I'd refer you to the Department of Defense. Um, 
I mean, the other thing that uh, I do know also occurred over the weekend is that there was a follow-up conversation uh, between U.S. military officials and Russian military officials uh, to pursue our deconfliction efforts uh, inside of Syria. Uh, there was a preliminary conversation a couple of weeks ago, uh, and there was uh, another conversation over the weekend to follow up on those efforts. And you know, we continue to um, want to be focused on the practical operational level discussions that will make the environment for our mm -hmm. military pilots operating in the skies over Syria at least a little safer uh, and make sure they don't run uh, or make sure that the Russian efforts don't run headlong into uh, our ongoing operations. Uh, and thus far, uh, there's been no need for the United States or our coalition partners to in any way curtail our efforts uh, as a result of uh, what's, what Russia is doing in Syria right now. Last one on Biden. Given that there seems to be growing space between some of the president's policies and the presumptive front runner Hillary Clinton, but there doesn't appear to be any space between what the president believes and what uh, Vice President Biden believe, and especially if you're talking about continuing the process that was started and com continues over the past seven plus years, wouldn't it make sense then that he'd be the best mouthpiece to keep it going, the best representative to keep the president's policies moving forward, not Hillary Clinton? Well, Kevin, as I acknowledged last week, that in an, any presidential election, there will be uh, an obligation placed on each of the candidates to clearly articulate their views and priorities and policies. Uh, and that means they're going to need to distinguish themselves uh, among each other, but also uh, between uh, themselves and the incumbent. Uh, that's part of any presidential race. Uh, and the fact is, you know, I said this last week as well, no matter how good the first two terms have been, nobody's going to run a successful campaign predicated on uh, essentially a third term. Uh, each of these candidates is going to have to go out and make their own independent case. And uh, if Vice President Biden decides to get in the race, he'll have to do the same thing. Um, but ultimately, that will be a, a decision for him to make. The reason that he right now uh, you know, has, the, uh, has articulated uh, the same kind of positions that the president sought to advance is because he's a loyal vice president. That's what you're supposed to do when you're vice president. Uh, if and when he decides to become a presidential candidate, uh, he'll have to uh, more clearly articulate his own personal views on some things. I think the vast majority of those views uh, will be in line with what the president has pursued. But I think, uh, as you would expect from any, um, buddy ha anybody that has as much experience that he does, that there might be some policy areas where uh, he differs uh, with uh, not just with President Obama, but also with Secretary Clinton. Uh, and others with whom he's served inside this administration. Wouldn't it make the debate a lot more fun, though, if he were to yeah. show up tonight? <laughs> well, uh, I'll let you guys decide what the rating, how the ratings would be affected by uh, Vice President Biden's entry into the race. So I suspect this is something that my friends at uh, CNN have considered. He'll never match our numbers. <laughs> oh, well, we'll see. Uh, Michelle? Hi, on, the, on the same subject, really, yeah. um, I wonder if it's more than uh, coincidence that your fabulous graphics today came on the day of this first debate when yeah. In that area is where you're probably going to see the greatest distance between these front-running candidates and the president. And um, what effect do you think that opposition to the TPP is going to have on support for it and its ultimate passage? Yeah. Well, it is a coincidence because, uh, as you recall, I had originally intended to, uh, to show these on Friday, uh, but uh, uh, other events intervened. Um, so, so I did coincidentally um, have the opportunity to share them with you today. Uh, I do think it does serve as a pretty powerful illustration of the economic benefits of implementing the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, Agreement that was negotiated by this administration with uh, 11 other countries in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, we actually have, I, I showed slides for six or eight different states. There are actually slides for all 50, uh, and we can share those with you if you're interested. Uh, but ultimately, we would expect that for there to be a, a, a robust discussion and debate uh, in the context of a presidential campaign about the uh, wisdom of pursuing agreements uh, like this one. Uh, the president obviously has his own very strong views about how this uh, agreement will benefit middle class families. Uh, but I'll just point out that the debate about, the, about <coughs> trade over the summer uh, did not have an impact on our ability to build a bipartisan coalition in Congress to support trade promotion authority legislation. Uh, and uh, while, we while we certainly would welcome support from 
uh, anybody who has to offer it. Uh, we're not particularly concerned um, uh, about the impact it will have on the congressional debate just based solely on our experience over the summer. Yeah, several times now you mentioned how much um, the administration welcomes robust debate, that it's good for democracy. Um, so given that there's been so much debate now over the number of democratic debates, um, <laughs> would the president then welcome more democratic debates, or does he think that there should be more of it? <coughs> well, I haven't heard the president articulate a view on this. This is obviously something that the, the Democratic National Committee has to work out and organize, not just among the candidates, but uh, among the media organizations that are <coughs> eager to sponsor those uh, kind of engagements. What about you then, Josh? Do you think that there Well, I guess uh, my sense is that um, over the course of two and a half hours tonight, uh, there will be ample discussion of uh, a public policy. Um, and um, look, it would it, be up to the candidates to. I guess the other thing that I would say is that um, certainly with all due respect to the news organizations that uh, devote significant time and resources to organizing these kinds of engagements, it's not the only way to have a debate about public policy. Uh, that there are opportunities for uh, candidates to make public speeches, to host town hall meetings, that that's part uh, of taking the public debate to um, the electorate. And uh, that's a good thing for our democracy. And, um, you know, many people lament the length uh, of presidential campaigns uh, in this country. And there are certainly uh, a number of downsides to the length uh, of these kinds of campaigns. Uh, but the one upside is that it certainly does um, ensure that we have, uh, and when I say we, I mean as an American citizen and as an American voter, we have ample opportunity uh, to consider uh, the policies and priorities and agenda uh, of everybody who's running for president. And that's a good thing. And going back to that 60 Minutes interview, um, I, I knew you just said that the president made those comments on whether or not Hillary Clinton's email issue was a national security issue based on what is publicly known. But given that there's the investigation is still going on, was, mm -hmm. was he trying to preclude the results of that investigation? Or? Uh, absolutely not. The president has a healthy respect for the kinds of uh, independent investigations that are conducted by inspectors general and uh, where necessary by the FBI. That's the question then. So mm -hmm. if he has a healthy respect for an investigation that's ongoing to the point that you guys almost never want to say anything about that subject, then why would he say so confidently that it is not an, or was not a national security issue? Mm -hmm. why, why would he say that as a statement of fact? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think because that was the question. The, I, I don't have the transcript right in front of me. I think that was directly the question that he was asked, and so he's trying to answer the question based on what we all know uh, right now publicly about uh, this particular case. Uh, but it certainly was not an attempt uh, in any way uh, to undermine the importance or independence of the ongoing FBI investigation. So does he in fact not know until the results of the investigation whether or not this could have had an impact on national security? Well, I think, again, I think that's, um, you know. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I think what I'm saying is that what the president, based on what the president knows now, uh, and that's what all of us know now. The president wasn't speaking uh, based on any uh, uh, information that has not yet been made public, uh, but based on what has been made public uh, and based on the public pronouncements of Secretary Clinton herself, uh, that's how the president arrived at the conclusion that this, this has not and does not pose a threat to national security. Uh, but obviously the uh, FBI will take their own independent look at this. Um, and uh, you know, for questions about the status of that investigation, I refer you to them. Okay. Mara. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think you were asked about this before. The, okay. the rumors about Iran wanting 19 prisoners perhaps to swap Jason Lisey and Do you know anything mm -hmm. about that? Uh, I know that that's something that the uh, Iranians have discussed uh, previously. Uh, I don't have an update for you at this point on uh, our ongoing efforts to secure the release of either Mr. Rezaian or Mr. Abedini, uh, Mr. Hekmati, uh, or to learn more about the whereabouts of Mr. Levinson, other than to tell you uh, that the cases of those individuals continues to be a top priority for this government. Uh, and you heard Secretary Kerry himself, uh, after the talks were concluded, say uh, that he uh, raised the status of those American citizens who were unjustly detained in Iran right now uh, in every single engagement he had with his Iranian counterpart. And I think that's an indication to you of the priority that this administration places on the safe return of those American citizens. And just one question about your slideshow. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it struck me that this is the way that administrations have sold trade deals for like 20 years talking about these products and the states they're in and I guess I guess I was surprised because the trade debate has really moved on to a different 
um, stage, especially in the Democratic Party, where, where Democratic voters say, sure, the guys who own the leather boot company or the bourbon company or the, you know, the, the guys the who The barbecue make, sauce company. Yeah, the barbecue sauce company. Right. They're going to make, make, make out fine, but it's not going to produce jobs and trade deals have actually hurt us rather than helped us. I mean, that is a big, widespread view, whether it's <coughs> you agree with it or not. And yeah, sure. why doesn't your sales pitch deal with that anxiety directly? Well, uh, let me answer that question in a couple of ways. The very first time we started talking about the uh, Trade Pacific, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, uh, I spent a lot of time emphasizing how this agreement includes the toughest labor and environmental standards that have ever been inclus included in a trade deal. Uh, and the argument that is made by many uh, is that the labor standards uh, in other countries give them an unfair advantage over American workers, which is how they get uh, an unfair benefit uh, from, trade de from trade deals. That's precisely what the President has rectified by trying to level the playing field uh, for American workers and American businesses. And the benefits are significant. You know, when we talk about, uh, and I, I guess I also want to turn you to the Ohio example because it's uh, an illustrative one. We spent a lot of time talking about how important it is for the United States to counter uh, China's repeated efforts to dump tires into the uh, American market, uh, that this has the effect of putting American businesses and American workers at a competitive disadvantage. That's some, you know, when the, when the administration has taken decisive action to question those practices at the WTO, uh, and every time we've gotten a verdict from the WTO, it's been a ruling in our favor, which means we have succeeded in advocating for American products, that is a victory that has been roundly cheered by uh, not just the owners of the tire companies, but also by the uh, union representatives uh, of the employees of that tire company. So the fact is, if we can protect uh, unfair trade practices by China in the United States and have that be good for American workers, then being able to advocate for American goods overseas should also be good for American workers. That's the consistency that you find in our argument, and it's a consistency that, unfortunately, uh, is not present in the argument of many of our critics. It's always been a tough sell for Democrats to, to get the votes for, for trade deals. Why do you think it's become so much harder? Well, I don't know that it's harder. Uh, every single Democratic candidate you know, against TPP, a Democratic president's big policy. Yeah, but I guess my point is I don't know that that's something uh, – you, you're more of a student uh, of previous debates about trade agreements. Just as hard as it's always been. Yeah, that's, I guess that's the case that I'm making. And, uh, and uh, we've not uh, sought to downplay that. I think that we certainly have, uh, there are a number of things, uh, elements in our case to make about why Democrats should support this trade agreement, even if they haven't historically supported trade agreements. And that's because it includes the toughest labor standards that have ever been included. Uh, in a uh, trade deal. It includes the highest environmental standards that have ever been included uh, in a trade deal. And there are some significant documented economic benefits associated with this trade deal, primarily because we're talking about a trade agreement that has an impact on 40 percent of the global economy. So when we're, when we're talking about opening up opportunity for American uh, businesses overseas, uh, this is a lot of opportunity that's out there. And we're talking about some of the countries that have some of the fastest growing economies in the world. So the, I guess the, the point is that we feel strongly about making sure that this trade agreement is consistent with the kinds of values uh, that the President has championed throughout his career in public service long before he even thought about running for President, um, but also uh, making sure that we maximize the benefits that are associated with these kinds of agreements. You haven't put a jobs number on this trade deal, have you? I don't believe that we have, uh, but um, you could check with USTR to see if they have any kind of projection to offer. Okay. Uh, Arlette. Uh, Congressman Paul Ryan's considering running for speaker, and he's shown a few examples where he's willing to compromise the Ryan Murray budget in 2013 as an example. Mm -hmm. Would the White House uh, like to see a speaker, Paul Ryan? <laughs> well, um, I think, as I mentioned at the end of, uh, of last week, uh, it's unlikely that uh, an endorsement of anybody uh, by me from here uh, would be helpful to any Republican's candidacy. So um, rather than try to navigate that uh, twisted knot of political complexity, uh, I'm just going to let uh, Republicans decide for themselves who they believe should uh, lead the Republican conference. 
what I will observe, though, is that whomever that person is, uh, they will face the same kind of challenge that Speaker Boehner has faced for the last several years, which is that there is a uh, small but loud contingent in the Republican conference that time and again has put their own rigid extremist ideology ahead of effective government that's clearly in the best interest of middle class families all across the country. And while it's easy to hold, uh, hold those extremists liable for the dysfunction that we see in Congress, the fact is the majority of the Republican conference could do something about it. They could stand up to those extremists in their own conference or they could do the thing that is actually clearly in the best interest of the country, which is rather than insisting that every important thing that happens in Congress get done along party lines, actually try to cooperate with Democrats on something. That doesn't mean that they have to fold uh, or uh, concede their conservative principles. Uh, actually, what they just need to do is negotiate with a Democratic minority uh, so that they can get something done for the American people. And they can do that consistent with their conservative principles. It may require them to compromise a little bit. It may mean that they don't get 100% of everything that they want. But that's the essence of democracy, particularly in an era where there's one party in charge of Congress and another party that's in charge of the White House. Now, on Vice President Joe Biden, he's spent over two months now mulling very publicly this decision about 2016. And there's some who are starting My guess to is he's been thinking about it even a little bit longer than that. <laughs> but um, there are some who are starting to say that he owes the Democratic Party an answer now, sooner rather than later. Do you think that the vice president owes that to Dem Democrats? Um, no. Uh, I think, quite frankly, that the, the vice, that vice President Biden, uh, given his service to the party and, more importantly, his service to the country, uh, is certainly entitled to the amount of time that he believes is necessary uh, to make what is an intensely personal decision for him. Okay. And also on the debate, um, in 2008, President Obama uh, debated against Hillary Clinton many times. What That's advice true. do you think he would uh, give to her challengers <laughs> today? Uh, he did engage in dozens of debates, and I don't think that's an exaggeration, uh, with Secretary Clinton over the course of uh, 2007 and uh, 2008. Um, I haven't spoken to him about any advice that he would offer. I don't think that he um, – I think the, uh, the advice that he would offer – uh, is advice that he would offer any candidate, whether they're debating against Secretary Clinton or not. Uh, and that is that they uh, should spend time preparing for those debates uh, and be focused on communicating as clearly as possible with the American public uh, what their priorities are. Uh, and that that will, that the person who can most cleanly uh, articulate their values and priorities uh, is typically the, the candidate that comes away uh, looking the best uh, in these debates. Um, uh, but again, I, you know, every candidate will have the opportunity to do that tonight, including Secretary Clinton herself. Okay. April. Josh, I have a couple subjects I want to ask you about. Um, back when Joe Biden, listening to all the questions and about Joe Biden, but indirectly about him, has the White House set up some type of contingency plan if he does decide to run for president in 2016? Uh, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> So if he were to decide to run, this White House would just change and shift at that time, or it would just function as normal without well, him here I think, on the campaign trail? Well, you've heard me. I mean, uh, certainly in the context of these briefings, we've spent a lot of time talking about the important tasks that Vice President Biden has taken on uh, in that role. And, you know, I think that's one reason that the President, uh, in the interview with 60 Minutes, described uh, Vice President Biden as uh, among the most consequential vice presidents in the history of the United States. Uh, and that's because Vice President Biden has taken on significant uh, tasks, everything from uh, working on gun safety initiatives to implementing the um, uh, Recovery Act uh, to working closely with foreign leaders in a variety of hotspots, including Iraq and Ukraine, to advance the interests of the United States. Uh, vice President Biden brings uh, an astonishing set of skills and experiences to this job. It's why he's been such an important part uh, of this team. And if he were to decide to dedicate some of those skills and experiences to running for president again, uh, there would be, that would have an impact on some of the things that we're doing here. But we would, um, I, I guess, you know, the other thing is it's hard to imagine a scenario where Vice President Biden uh, resigns his seat uh, or resigns the office. Uh, he certainly would uh, continue to be in a position to make calls and participate in meetings 
Uh, it just mean, means that he would also have to de dedicate some of his time to campaigning for the office. So the point is, um, yes, it would, I would acknowledge that it would require some changes around here, but we would still benefit from uh, Vice President Biden's service uh, as vice president, even if he chose to run for president. So let's say, um, and this is not a hypothetical, TPP. Um, let's say Vice President Biden, as he's thinking about it, he decides next week, okay, I'm going to run. Do you have, do you still think that you have that person to talk to congressional leaders to help push TPP forward, or will the president be the one meeting with congressional leaders and talking and, and talking about it? Well, the president already has been uh, involved in those kinds of uh, uh, conversations, uh, but uh, I certainly, in, the, in that scenario, I wouldn't rule out uh, Vice President Biden's involvement as well. Okay. And, and the next subject, um, pretty simple. Um, criminal justice, there's a markup um, on thoughts of the bills and within the next couple of weeks. What does the President primarily want to see come out of that? Because we're hearing that um, the disparity in sentencing, the retroactive sentencing, is one of the biggest components of both. Um, but if, if something fails, what is the biggest piece that you want to keep? Well, I, you know, April, I think the, the most important thing right now at the beginning of this process uh, is for Democrats and Republicans to try to move forward in bipartisan fashion. Uh, I think the only way that we're going to be able to move criminal justice reform across the finish line in Congress is if Democrats and re Republicans work together to get it done. Uh, and that's going to require, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, a willingness to compromise. And it means that Democrats aren't going to get everything that they want. Uh, out of this uh, reform effort, and Republicans aren't going to get everything they want out of the reform effort either. But there does appear to be significant common ground in confronting some of these issues. And while we're hopeful uh, that a good piece of legislation will come out of this process in the Senate, at least where it started, uh, I don't think there's anybody that's, that thinks that it will be a perfect piece of legislation. Uh, so that willingness to compromise, that willingness to accept uh, less than 100 percent of what ideally you'd like to see uh, will be an important priority for those who are engaged in these conversations. Okay. Substantively, though, uh, I think that uh, there's been extensive discussion about uh, sentencing reforms. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about reforms for juvenile justice uh, programs. Uh, I would identify those as sort of two priorities uh, in the context of uh, this legislation. Thank you. And I want to go back to something you said about TPP. You said the President is reaching out. Could you tell us how he's reaching out to congressional leaders? Is he having meetings? What? Is he on the phone? Uh, Can you tell us? I don't have a lot of details uh, to share at this point. But I mean, I think the important thing to recognize is that the, um, the vote on this, uh, on this agreement is uh, quite a ways off. Uh, that uh, the text will have to be completed, translated into a variety of different languages. It will be made public for 60 days before the President himself even signs it. Uh, there will be additional time for uh, that text to be considered publicly before Congress would consider it and it would go through the congressional process. So uh, a final vote uh, on legislation is quite a ways off. Uh, but you know, I guess what I was referring to is over the summer when we were trying to advance trade promotion authority, the President was deeply engaged uh, in the effort to move that across the finish line and it required him to speak to the Democratic uh, caucus at one point and even go to the congressional baseball game. Uh, so, you know, the President uh, was obviously very personally involved in trying to advance that, uh, that legislation um, that was eventually successful. So there's no legwork, groundwork right now? Well, um, there certainly is uh, an effort to communicate with Capitol Hill to make sure that they understand uh, exactly what's been completed here to help them uh, understand what's included in the agreement. Uh, but ultimately, we'll have the text of that agreement out so that everybody can consider it for themselves. Thank you. Okay. Bill? Just wanted to point out that you have an opportunity today to help the Vice President make an announcement should he desire to do so, <laughs> simply by opening up the photo op with the President, the Attorney General, and the Vice President, which is scheduled in about 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, I'm not aware that the Vice President has any announcements that are planned for today. Well, why don't we uh, ask him? So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sure his office would be happy to take your call. You're not going to open uh, it up? No, I don't think so. Oh. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Andrew. I wanted to go back to the issue of Iran's missile test. Um, if indeed they've broken a UN Security Council resolution, would uh, the U.S. continent additional sanctions on Iran, even if that puts in jeopardy implementation of the nuclear deal? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Andrew, let me just say that this is something that we're continuing to look at. Uh, and the details of this particular launch are important to determining uh, whether or not they are uh, in violation of the existing United Nations Security Council resolutions that govern 
uh, Iran's uh, ballistic missile program. Uh, the United States certainly takes seriously uh, those violations. Uh, and you know, you'll recall that when the President convened a summit meeting of our Gulf Coast partners at Camp David, uh, that there was uh, ample discussion about countering uh, Iran's uh, malign activities uh, in the region. Uh, and we certainly do believe that there is more work that could be done to uh, interdict uh, materials and equipment that could be used to advance their missile program. Uh, that is work that requires uh, international cooperation. Uh, and uh, the President has indicated a, um, not just a willingness, but even a desire to work more closely uh, with our allies and with our partners in the Gulf Coast, uh, or in the Gulf, to, uh, um, uh, to counter uh, Iran's ballistic missile program. And on a separate issue on Syria, um, just following up on the question about deconfliction before, um, reportedly the UK, the Royal Air Force in the UK has been, pilots have been given orders to shoot down Russian aircraft if they are engaged by Russian aircraft in the Middle East. Um, has the President okayed any similar orders for US pilots? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd refer you to the Department of Defense for any uh, uh, operational updates uh, like that. The Commander-in-Chief certainly has the expectation that our uh, military pilots, whether they're operating in Syria or anywhere else in the world, uh, will take the steps they believe are necessary to protect themselves. Okay. And a question, a final question, sorry, uh, indulge me on um, Israel and the Palestinian territories. Mm -hmm. Is the White House concerned that we're seeing the beginnings of a third intifada? And if so, even if not, um, is there, do you believe that the absence of a possible two-state solution uh, following what was said by the Israeli Prime Minister during the election campaign has contributed to a situation on the ground that makes it more likely that that kind of intifada could take place? Mm -hmm. Well, Andrew, let me start by saying that the United States condemns in the strongest possible terms the terrorist attacks, uh, the recent terrorist attacks uh, against Israeli civilians, which resulted in the murder of three Israelis and left numerous others wounded. Uh, we mourn any loss of life, whether it's Israeli or it's Palestinian. The United States continues to stress the importance of condemning violence and combating incitement, uh, and we're in regular contact with both the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority. Uh, we continue to be deeply concerned about escalating tensions and urge all sides to take affirmative steps to restore calm and prevent actions that would further escalate tensions. Um, Andrew, you know, the, the policy of the United States has been uh, the that a two-state solution that is negotiated uh, directly between the two parties is the most effective way for us to resolve uh, the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Uh, and in the meantime, we've urged both sides to try to exercise restraint uh, and to prevent the further escalation of tensions uh, in a region that's been roiled by them for generations. Okay. John Gizzi, you gave the last one. Yeah. Thank you, Judge. Two very brief questions on Russia. Um, has the administration, either through statement or in the president's talks with President Putin, have either weighed in on the case of Lieutenant Nadia Shevchenko, who was the Ukrainian who was the uh, Air Force pilot kidnapped from Ukraine, brought to Russia, put on trial in Moscow, and as of yesterday, undergoing psychiatric evaluation after her hunger mm -hmm. strike? Uh, John, I'd, re I'd refer you to the State Department for the latest uh, uh, of our efforts in that regard. Right. And the other question is this. December will mark the third anniversary of the President's signing of the Magnitsky Act, which are sanctions against individual Russians involved in the death of Sergei Magnitsky in 2009. He was a lawyer and accountant who got into a little row with the Kremlin. Um, last week, Vladimir Karamurtsov, who was a Russian dissident, uh, who went through a poisoning in May that I think he commented on, he said that the administration's targeted a lot of smaller level people with sanctions, but no major figures around President Putin. Are there any plans for that kind of uh, sanctioning uh, to take place soon? Well, John, that's a difficult question to answer, because when it comes to sanctions, uh, it would not be in our strategic interest to discuss what future plans we may have with regard to sanctions. Uh, if we were to discuss those plans in some detail in advance, it would only make it easier for those who may be the target of sanctions to take steps to evade them before they're uh, imposed. 
So uh, I'd refer you to the Treasury Department, who's responsible for those uh, implementing those sanctions. They may be able to give you a, a, a sense of what they're considering, uh, but I would not anticipate them being able to provide uh, a lot of information uh, with a lot of specificity in advance because it would only undermine our overall effort. Okay. Thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, we can get you a statement on that. Yeah.